that happened? And, 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 and what, what does Jesus mean to you? you know, I don't know how it's happened. I mean, I, I can point to all kinds of events and moments and so forth and ideas. It's mysterious, but yeah, Jesus means everything to me. Uh, I have, I've come to recognize that, um, that, he did, that it was, it's not a mirage in history. It's not an idea that someone thunk up. <laughs> Uh, Jesus was historically real. He was who he claimed to be. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Savior of my life and of all humanity. And I understand him to be a very real person. He lives today. And he invited me to become part of his kingdom. And I said, how do I become part of your kingdom? He said, open your life to me. Let me, and I use this metaphor, which, which works for me, let me sit on the, th on, the th on the throne of your own heart, of your own life. And I said, yes, if you would. And he has. Hmm. And he helps me and he lives with me. But I also I know that he is there forever. And so this creator who came into the squabbling <laughs> world of children and of beasts is God's son. And through his gift of his life, I have received that. And now in life, I am changed. Hmm. And I am being forever changed. And I am being forever promised this marvelous world with God the creator forever and ever. And I just, I, I just can't tell you, Jim, how, how wonderful this moment is to my life, but how grateful I am that this Jesus said, Brian, let me become your Lord and Savior and King. Mm. And I'm not good enough to say yes. I just know that at one moment in my life, and in many, many moments, I said yes. And, that, and that's available for anybody. And I just, there's no one, there's nothing in, in life that, that is important as Jesus. And when I get to the end of, the, end of life and when I receive when I die and receive my resurrected body and stand before the Lord, what matters more than anything li in life is to hear him say, well done, son, enter to the joy of your reward. His approval means more than anything else, and it begins with believing in Jesus. Brian Starr, thank you so much. Have a very Merry Christmas, and thank you, you too, friends, and we'll see you again next time when I die. Presented in part by Just Flooring. It's about time. Tonight we're talking about sexual assault. Uh, our guest tonight is Rick Bradshaw, a professor at Trinity Western University. Good to have you back again, Good professor. Uh, Jillian Finstra, got it right at that time. There we go, and she is a counselor. And Sheila Early, who's a sexual assault nurse examiner. Uh, when we started the program, you know, I, I'm, I was really quite shocked when I talked about how prevalent a problem. You're talking about one out of four women will be sexually assaulted in their lives. Yeah. And those are the ones we know about. Right. Yeah. We must have different levels of sexual assault when we just say the word sexual assault. Yeah. So what are we talking about from a legal standpoint? With that, Sheila, would you be the good one to talk on that? Um, I mean, there, there actually are three levels in the Criminal Code of Canada. Uh, one is sexual assault, and it's defined as um, basically unwanted touching of what we consider the um, personal parts of the body. Uh, there is sexual assault with a weapon, which is a higher level of an offense. And then there is sexual assault with threats to what's called a third party. So when, when something is, uh, a, the crime is committed during threats to, say, perhaps a child and a mother is sexually assaulted, that this is a higher level of, of crime. So there are different levels within the criminal, criminal code that differentiate these increased levels of invasion of, of personal self. We were talking uh, before the program, and I was saying to you that uh, after our last program, we had doctor. Uh, 
person came up to me at a place that I go to quite often, and uh, she had worked a lot in bars. And she said to me, I couldn't believe the program you had on the other night. She said, I personally believe that for about six months I was sexually assaulted every night, uh, either verbally or just men grabbing, uh, taking, you know, get a few drinks underneath them and that type of thing. But she said, I never once felt like uh, I had the guts to report it or to go after it. I mean, after all, I work in a bar. And that's some of the problem, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, as a society, we've just kind of given in to that. It's just an accepted thing. How's the justice system doing as far as uh, convictions? I can speak from my program, which is uh, 11 years old, uh, next month. Uh, we've seen approximately 1,200 men and women, mostly women. 97% of our patients are women. And less than 10% of those actually go to court. And of that, the conviction rate does seem to be higher because of the a number of factors. One, I'd like to think, is because of the forensic evidence collected by the nurse examiners who work on our team. But also, too, the courts have to be prepared to take those forward. And that's not always the case. Uh, why, why is it not always Well, the courts have to look, weigh the evidence before the... There's a, an, what's usually called an intake prosecutor or crown counsel who decides whether this is something that is uh, prosecutable, first of all. Uh, first of all, you have to find someone to, to have a, lay a charge to. So if this is an unknown person, you have to find them first. Yeah. Um, secondly, uh, this may be somebody that the person knows, which is usually the case. And the, the victim or the patient may choose not to go ahead with this for a variety of reasons. And some of it may be self-preservation as well. So there's a number of reasons. You just don't want to go through the trauma. Exactly. And then, and then, like we've seen in some very well-known cases lately, all of a sudden the person who may have committed the sexual assault sits back and says, wait a second, you know, it was, it was mutual consent. It was rough. It was whatever it was. But the bottom line is, she wanted it. And then a person sits back and says, well, how do I fight that? Because it's kind of my, I mean, there wasn't anybody else there witnessing the assault. In, in a lot of these situations, right? That's correct. That makes it very tough. Well, we'll come back. We'll talk some more. I want to talk a little bit about uh, why you're actually doing the study that you're doing and what is this study that you're doing sure. and what do you hope to accomplish. We'll come back and talk about that with uh, Dr. Bradshaw, Jillian Feenstra, and uh, Sheila Early is with us tonight. Uh, how about you? Have you been a victim of sexual assault? Uh, how are you doing? What have you done about it? And did you get the satisfaction uh, out of the out of the situation did you go to court or are you dealing with it well at all maybe you're not like to hear from you 1866 now tv 10 perhaps you can help someone else tonight we'll be right back captioning of this program is brought to you in part by Jim Pattison Toyota of North Shore and Surrey. We're more than just a dealership. Meet the babes of Bayside High. Lisa's the name. Hey dudes, let's dish. And Ooh. gossip's her game. Check out Kelly. Oh, <laughs> Pardon my perkiness. She's not hot, she's nuclear. Make a date with the babes of Bayside High. Catch the next Saved by the Bell. Daily at 4 and 4.30. Save now on the unique style of rattan. Visit Exotic Furnishings in Richmond for affordable decorating ideas. Exotic Furnishings is celebrating 25 years of service with a huge expansion sale of rattan furniture. Save up to 50% on rattan, seagrass, wicker and teak indoor and outdoor designs. Let us help you make the perfect choice. Hurry in. Huge sale ends September 11th. Service and satisfaction guaranteed. Exotic furnishings. Bridgeport and Shell Road in Richmond, one mile west of Ikea. At Open Road Toyota in Port Moody, we pride ourselves on quality. Thanks to our knowledgeable product advisors and managers, we know it rains in Vancouver. So for your comfort and convenience, we built one of the largest indoor pre-owned showrooms in Western Canada. So if you're in the market for a quality new or pre-owned vehicle, visit Open Road Toyota Port Moody, just five minutes west of Coquitlam Centre, the perfect location. Open Road Toyota, 3166 St. John Street, Port Moody.
Support your favorite team. Visit Sports Zone, your pro sports store. We have everything you need for hockey, baseball, and soccer. For more, log on to SportsZoneSports.com. A family that plays together stays together. At Family Recreation Stores, there's an amazing variety of board games and great supplies for all the new poker players. From specialized table games for fun to hot tubs for relaxation. Check out FamilyRecreation.com or visit us at South Fraser Way in Abbotsford. Blessings, blessings, blessings. Beautiful hair, outstanding aesthetics. Blessings Hair and Aesthetic Studio, specializing in wedding parties and corrective work. Let Blessings make right what someone else did wrong. Visit our hot new location at 19475 Fraser Highway, just north of Willowbrook Mall in Langley. Call 533-2772 today for your appointment. Bless yourself. Blessings Hair and Aesthetic Studio. Very scary factoid right there. Sixty percent of the males said they would use force if they thought they could get away with it. Yeah. Welcome back to online. We're talking about sexual assault tonight, and uh, the reason we're doing that is I have uh, Rick Bradshaw, who's with us. He's a professor at Trinity Western University. We're going to talk about this study that he is putting together, and perhaps you might be able to help out. Uh, Jillian Finstra, Finstra is with us. She's a counselor, and Sheila Early, who's the sexual assault nurse examiner. Uh, when we had you on the program last time, you created quite a stir. Matter of fact, we had uh, just a lot of emails asking about this study that you were going to do. Yeah. So let's talk about that. You are doing a study on sexual assault. Yeah. Uh, what is this study? Okay. Well, for start, it's a comparison of three different treatments for sexual assault. Um, one of the treatments acts neurologically. It actually changes patterns of electroencephalography in the brain and, and that kind of thing. Um, another one works on cognitions, beliefs, and thoughts that women have after a sexual assault and which ones, you know, stick around and give them trouble. And the third one works straight physically in terms of relaxation of the body in different ways. And so um, we're recruiting right now 42 women and we want them to be adults. We want the assault to have occurred when they're adolescents or adults. We want them to have no more than one or two assaults. So in other words, not someone who's had a whole history. And ideally, just because they get three to six sessions of individual and six to nine sessions of group, that's not a lot when you think of a whole lifetime of abuse. So if someone has had a whole, a, a fairly heavy childhood history of abuse, that might be too much for this study. It's certainly important for them to get therapy, but in this particular study, we're looking for women who have experienced maybe one or two sexual assaults in that adolescent or adult period. It, ideally, it would be good if they're a year or more post-assault, but we have no upper limit. So it could have been 20 years ago, it could have been 30 years ago, because a lot of times post-traumatic stress disorder will hang around for years. You know, 50% um, of the women who experience sexual assault get post-traumatic stress disorder. And the symptoms of that would be the hyperarousal, the startle reflex, irritability, difficulty sleeping, they get intrusions, they get sort of re-experiencing, whether it's through nightmares or um, flashbacks of the experience. Yeah. Are you saying that these, these symptoms last uh, different lengths of time with, uh, with different women? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's part of what the study is going to do is why some would retain it longer and some would retain it less? I mean, would that be... Mo mostly what it's about is comparing these different treatments. And we're looking at depression, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, um, brainwave activity in four different areas of the brain, and a number of other different symptoms and changes in those symptoms with these three different therapies. So we're actually comparing the therapies is what we're really about. Right, so the phone number is up here. Now this is the phone number how they could get in touch with you yep. and if they want to be part and would be willing to be a part of this study. You yep. need approximately about 20 more, yeah. Yeah. 20 more women. Sure. Men involved in this? No, women. This particular study is for women. assault on women. Certainly it happens to men, and um, surely Sheila, Sheila will probably talk more about that. But uh, in this particular study, it's women, yeah. Right. And the women are going to get therapy from female therapists, so that's important for them. So Jillian is one of the therapists in the study, for example. So that's an important thing for them to realize if they have doubts or concerns about that. 
All right, 604-513-2164. It's on the screen right now. So hopefully we can uh, pull some people together with you. Uh, we're going to come back and talk about some of the common therapies. Jillian, I'd like to talk to you about that, and uh, we will talk about that in a second. But earlier today, uh, Now TV spoke uh, with Hannah Barto. She's a sexual assault nurse, and she's an examiner, uh, about how drug-involved sexual assaults are affecting young people and how. How is, uh, I guess, drug-enabled or drug-assisted sexual assault how has that changed in the last few years in Surrey from your point of view? Well, from my point of view, I've been working in the program for just over two years now. And from my point of view, I'm, I see a lot of uh, men and women who come in who have taken alcohol knowingly and willingly, and, and that's usually at a party or at a nightclub. And that's uh, very common. I don't think that that's changed a whole lot. What's changing, it seems, is that uh, there's an attitude that it's... Um, almost okay or somebody's deserving of being sexually assaulted because they either willingly took uh, illegal drugs or something was slipped to them and they don't know what's happened and there's this idea that um, somebody being passed out is okay because it's an implied consent which it's not illegal it's absolutely illegal has has that increased in the last few years or the fact that it's you know people think it's okay has that changed or has that always been the case for you in the well in the last two years um, I think it's stayed pretty consistent uh, the number of uh, drug facilitated sexual assaults that we see tend to be um, usually the younger um, adolescents maybe under the age of 24 or so and uh, often it's when they've gone to a party or something and they've been um, drinking uh, but we are also seeing things like um, drugs being slipped into gum or candy or food because it's not just drinks and and so while our youth are starting to be much more aware of watching their drinks at a party or watching their, um, their drinks at a nightclub, uh, we have to remember that, you know, even somebody, stranger or even a friend offering gum, potentially there's something in that too. And that's where things are getting a little bit scary too. Types of drugs that are being used right now? It's hard to say. Alcohol is definitely the number one, and it's usually taken knowingly. Um, other drugs that are being used are uh, ecstasy, GHB, Rohypnol, which is the one that's most commonly heard in the media, and ketamine, or in other words, known as vitamin K. Mm -hmm. How do you hope this changes in the next five to ten years? I hope that the awareness is increased, especially with our youth um, who are partying. I hope that the young women especially are recognizing that it's, um, it's not okay for somebody to have sex with you when you're passed out or when you're under the influence of alcohol or any types of drugs. And I hope the young men are learning this as well. Um, it seems that young men don't know that it's not okay, that if they've had sex with her once, that you know, just because she's passed out, it doesn't mean it's okay to have sex with her again. Um, so I think it just needs to be an awareness that this is not okay and that alcohol does not give, um, it actually takes away a person's right to consent, both men and women. Doesn't give, takes away. It gi exactly. It takes away your ability to consent to sexual interaction of any type. Hannah, thank you again for your time. Thank you. It just amazes me, you know, when I hear that interview and it says that we need to get the message across to young men that it's not okay to have sex with somebody who's maybe passed out because of alcohol. Have I just come out from underneath a rock or something? What's going on in our society that we have these kind of things? I mean, from Sheila, from, from your standpoint, seeing these things on a regular basis, as you do. I do. How do you handle that? I mean, you know, we see a society out here, and one of the questions, one of the myths out there are women are sexually assaulted because they ask for it, the way they dress, the way they act. I mean, they're out drinking. They're out maybe doing a, a drug or they're out doing something. So obviously they're sexually active. They wanted it. You know, how do you, how do you get around that kind of an attitude? Well, I think that's one of the reasons why we have such a low reporting rate for the actual incidents, because people know the, the cultures that we live in and, and the media and our, the family cultures and our community cultures say, you know, this is part of your contribution if you want to this and that's one of the reasons why the blame on victims um, stops them from reporting and they choose to live in silence to suffer in silence rather than come forward because of embarrassment or lack of belief or the fact that they really don't know what happened and sometimes they will never know what happened for example if it has been a drug facilitated sexual assault uh, on the other hand they may get pieces and uh, parts back again which come back in in the post-traumatic stress as flashbacks and they live with it forever 
uh, this does not go away. It is a life-altering experience. And one of those issues about consent is that only the two people involved really know what consent was given and or not given. Wow. Yeah. I think one of the other pieces too, Doug, is, is just the reality that for a lot of women, it's so overwhelming and so traumatizing to go through an experience like that that they will often just dissociate that experience and may stay in a very dissociated state for a long time which also contributes to the low reporting but it is also um, a really key piece in getting into therapy and trying to break through that dissociation in order to